today on Know How. We're going to talk all about gaming routers, the cloud, networking, and a whole lot more right now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Avnet. Avnet and Not Impossible Labs created a historic event at the Life is Beautiful Music Festival, a first of its kind live concert that helped the deaf and hearing communities experience music in a whole new way. Visit avnet.com slash music1 to see the journey. And by Ring, Ring's alarm security kit is a smarter way to protect your entire home. Go to ring.com slash knowhow to learn how you can get whole home security for only $10 per month. Oh, hello. I didn't see you standing there. Welcome to Know How. I'm Jason Howell, joined as always for this gaming series with none other than Sam Skovich from Ars Technica. On the other side of the world, where are you? Tokyo, where are you? Seattle, Washington. Oh, that's right. That's where you live. Come on. Well, you were talking about Tokyo. I kind of just wanted to see what it would be like to, you know, Sam Skovich takes on Tokyo. I would be 14 or 16 hours in the future if we were talking in <laughs> Tokyo. That's the shortest version of that. You've got such an impressive game wall. I want to come over and play some games with you. And that's why we brought you on, right? Because you are the game master. Uh, it's great to see you again, Sam. Thank you for uh, hopping on today to talk well, about Well, it's important that we're talking over an, an internet protocol because I, I believe today's episode is about specifically internet and network performance for when you want to plug your favorite video games into the internet. I hear that the kids these days like to play their video games online. I hear that everybody is really getting into this new thing called the internet on, on it's the, this, um, the World Wide it's Web. Like a, it's like a highway, but it's <laughs> yes. super, and it's got information. Yeah, 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 yeah. You uh, don't want to be driving a, a Volkswagen bug down this information superhighway. <laughs> so yeah, we're definitely interested in helping you wade through useful tips and also some stuff that isn't necessarily as big of a deal as manufacturers may tell you. And yeah, we've got quite a bit to cover. Now, okay, so today, in in this modern gaming age, and it's been this, been this way for a long time, but... At what point did the internet and kind of being connected to the cloud go from a nice thing to have, kind of an interesting addendum to gaming, into kind of where we're at now where people just expect it? It's, it's such an important pivotal part to the gaming experience. I mean, I would pin it to when DSL and cable internet started becoming a lot more commonplace. Uh, I know for myself, I, I date myself a bit by saying I went to college uh, in 99 through 2002, and that was when a T1 connection got piped into oh, my yeah. door. Oh, and T1 that, was and the bomb. It yeah. was right around then that everybody started playing Counter-Strike. Uh, so you end up with this uh, sense of community and camaraderie when you have this sort of blanket expectation that everyone has high-speed internet. Now, you fast forward a little ways, and video game consoles started jumping on board with this. It was a really big deal that every Xbox 360, and even before that, every Sega Dreamcast, came with network networking built in. The very first Xbox did this, and that didn't yeah. quite take off, but the 360 sort of doubled down, made sure that there was Ethernet in every single Xbox. Xbox 360 hardware, and everything kind of went forward from there. Just having that sort of baseline access among affordable consumer tech with gaming in it has really pushed that forward. Now, you can rewind more and say that it was, you know, Q-Test, the Quake uh, online version that came out before the actual Quake game did that really got people's juices flowing for expecting online gaming. But really, I'd say in the mid-aughts is really when that tide got pushed. And that's when games like Halo and Call of Duty became the just standard things that you heard. You know, People used to say, I'm going to go play Nintendo. Now that catch-all might be, I'm going to play Call of Duty uh, or, well, really, Fortnite this year. But mm. essentially, that sort of commonplace everybody's playing this. Everyone at my school or all my friends are playing it. I one in. And, and from a multiplayer online perspective, which is really what this is all about, right? People syncing up with other people and that, that playing field expanding to, you know, talk about Fortnite. What is it, 100 players simultaneously in a single, in a single area? Like the data, the, the requirements around that now are so much more stringent, so much more, 
heavy than say the load 10, 15, you know, 10 years ago uh, when this when this was way you know earlier in its infancy. Right. I mean, that's an interesting thing happening on the server side of who's operating the games, right. what they're charging for it, and what you get as a result. Ultimately, though, games are still on the client side, meaning your own console or your own PC, kind of the same. You are trying to manage ping and latency and just get all of your button clicks to the main server as quickly as possible and get the information about everybody else back as quickly as possible. Really, in the great scheme of things, not a lot has changed other than all the speeds and access going up and up and up so that you can go from eight-player matches to 100-player matches. All right, so let's talk a little bit about these uh, things, kind of these items where things tend to fall apart for uh, online gaming uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, buffer bloat which is a very fun name to say. Uh, what, what is buffer bloat and how, how much of a difference, like what is the actual effect that a gamer is going to see if they're encountering this? Well, this is a, an interesting one to jump to in the get-go because buffer bloat isn't really a hugely popular term. You don't tend to hear about this when you go to Best Buy or you talk to right. uh, your service provider asking about the most intense uh, sort of gaming or online performance. But buffer bloat is a latency spike. I mean, this is a really, really s surface level sort of description, but it's a latency spike that results from your routers and modems and general infrastructure handling a lot of data. You, there's analogies out there. If you go to bufferbloat.net, there is a lot of information that talks about, well, honestly, a highway. We made a joke about the information superhighway, uh, but it talks about the idea that general internet traffic is this sort of management of a ton of cars, each of those cars being uh, packets of data being sent, and how it manages giant uh, chunks of them is putting those cars from the highway into a parking lot, then back through the highway again. Uh, and that means that you don't lose packets. Now, that's really important if you want to get every single bit in, of data from your computer to another and vice versa. You to get that, that guarantee that that data is going through. But the catch is you can end up with that sort of parking lot analogy slowing things down just enough. And the result of this when you're playing a video game in particular is that you'll see this sort of clumping that you'll have like a, a few, almost a second of a freeze and then a lot of activity fast forwarded again. Oh, you'll I've sometimes see before. that when you're maybe watching a Call of Duty kill cam replay where you see how it was you died and you'll see activity sort of chunked up in that way. So buffer bloat is one of these funky things that can really matter in the beat by beat action of a very intense online game, whether you're going for a frame perfect uh, session of Street Fighter or Tekken, or whether you're going for some sort of crazy fast many frames per second first person shooter. Um, now buffer bloat is one of those things that really comes down to your hardware. And I honestly think the biggest culprit is that default modem that you might get from your ISP. Uh, you can go and look up resources for different modems that you can buy yourself that are typically better in the buffer bloat management. Uh, I still currently use, I have to look up the exact model number. I bought this thing years ago. I have a Netgear CM400. This is a DOCSIS, D-O-C-S-I-S 3.0 standard, which my ISP in Seattle, Washington, Comcast, requires. And I get a maximum download that is not gigabit. 340 megabits per second. Mm -hmm. That's fine for the speed I have. I'm not quite gigabit, but even that is limited. But that has a higher buffer bloat ranking than what Comcast ships. So you really do, if you care about that sort of bit by bit latency, you want to look into uh, modem options. And plus, I personally say buy your own modem because you're paying that leasing fee to your ISP, and it's usually stupid. It's you're usually paying way too much, and you can get one of these modems for 30, 40, 50 bucks in one fell swoop, and that's only like four or five months of a leasing fee from your ISP all wrapped up. So uh, buffer. Bloat is definitely not a just catch all. Here's the exact thing that's going to make your performance better. But getting everything in your pipeline will help out for those little latency spikes, which aren't always consistent. But when they come up, they can screw you over in the video game of your choice. Yeah, and it's really it's really annoying to kind of be in the throes of something and then suddenly see that glitch happen in in real time. The fast forward, or maybe the person that you're there with suddenly and and they're gone. They kind of blink away. Those things are not fun. They pull you right out of the experience. That's what, obviously what you don't want in this experience in this uh, situation. Tick rate is another terminology that uh, you had brought up. 
What exactly is tick rate and how does, I mean, is this also very specific to say the modem or the router that you've chosen? So tick rate is a phrase that you may hear when you're, uh, it's actually come up with the latest Call of Duty game, Black Ops 4, because when people play online, they're reporting lower tick rates than they would like. So what is that? That is how often the server is sending updates and receiving updates. So if you're connecting to a 100 player match, uh, that tick rate might be lowered by the video game operator in order to manage all that you know, 80 to 100 players. And that means you'll get maybe 10, 12, 15 ticks per second, as opposed to what you might expect when you're playing at your own house, 30 ticks a second, which would match a 30 frames per second on your screen, uh. or 60 ticks a second, which would match the 60 tick, uh, frames per second if you have like a faster game and call of duty runs at 60 frames a second in general so you kind of want that extra speed so tick rate is not determined by your own system you can't get a faster xbox or a better modem if a game itself is serving a lower tick rate uh this ends up being a game by game basis sort of thing to look out for but if you are really a high level kind of fast gaming player, you'll want to check on tick rate if you really expect that sort of buttery smooth, I have the fastest computer, I have the really awesome cable modem that deals with buffer bloat, I'm ahead of the game, why aren't you ahead of the game, Activision or other game company? Uh, yeah. But that's the kind of thing that can vary game by game, hour by hour. Maybe you've logged in at a really uh, bloated time because there's just a lot of people logged in at once and the game operator in question has decided to not invest in enough servers for all of that and you get the slower tick rate. So all that means is that you will see, again, in a, a replay, like a death cam, as I'd mentioned before, you may just see a little herky-jerkier action as a result because what you sent to the server and what you received from the server is slower than how people were actually playing online. So again, it's one of those things that you might want to Google or Bing or whatever you search for uh, when you are, or DuckDuckGo is where I go, when you're looking for some information about that hot new online game before diving in, if you are super sensitive to that stuff. You may never notice that kind of thing, right. but for a game like Call of Duty, you almost certainly will. And are they going to list tick rate or they're just going to list the frames per second and you're going to hope that your tick rate is going to match I that. mean, tick rate is honestly a kind of thing that you have to go in and record your own gameplay, oh, maybe really using dumb. a capture camera or something like that, right. and then analyze, maybe have a camera pointed at your own mouse or your own joystick to sort of see how well it matches up. And you know, something that everybody's going to totally do. <laughs> there are people who do that. There are people who absolutely, sure. on Twitch, have multiple cameras set up and they are gung-ho about it. And that's there's a reason because those games are about high performance. Yeah. But you, you're never going to have a game company come out unless they have a really high tick rate and advertise it. It's sort of the, one of these interesting terms that I brought up because it's a higher level thing. You're not going to see it on the back of the box, but it's a cool thing to be aware of if you really care about this stuff. Yeah. Okay, right on. Well, let, then let's talk about a couple of, of things that people probably have heard more about. Uh, and i realizing as I look at this, probably so much so with port forwarding that it's kind of a non-issue at this point. But uh, is that helpful in the in the realm of kind of setting up your home network to make sure that you have the best quality kind of online uh, experience? Is port forwarding going to help you at all? If we were talking 10 years ago, I would say yes, especially because we ran into issues on Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 with specific types of network traffic being blocked because your router was saying, hold on, we are getting this request for back and forth specifically to a port that we are protecting, so we're going to block that out or we're going to relegate that to a different point. Uh, and you would still be able to play, but you might get slowed down or worse, you might not be able to connect specifically to certain modes or to certain friends. So at that point, you would have to go in and individually, you, your routers, uh, especially the wireless router, you would go in on a web browser and type in a certain address, usually 192.168.0.1 or something very similar to that. That's sort of this default that gets you into a router menu. And then you go in and you find a thing called port forwarding and type in these specific numbers as defined usually by the game maker in question. Uh, this is actually a thing that came up a lot because of torrenting or any sort of app you use where your bandwidth is shared, meaning you've downloaded the file and then you're going to upload it to other people. In fact, World of Warcraft famously used this sort of thing in order to make its uh, all of its updates and patches go a lot faster to other people. So port forwarding isn't just something for illegal BitTorrent downloaders. There's legitimate uses for it. And that exposes a lot of 
uh, ports because it's it's sending and receiving a ton of data in a relatively sensitive way. Now, in the modern era, whether you're playing on Windows, on Mac, Xbox One, PlayStation 4, Nintendo Switch, and on and on, UPnP has really solved it. Game systems and computers and the games and apps in question that rely on a lot of networking understand how to tie into UPnP in a way that interacts well with the game and interacts well with other people you're going to play with, either on your friends list or otherwise, so that you're not running into these issues where you can't connect to a cert playlist. You will be fine. So it's a perfectly valid thing to think about port forwarding as an essential gaming topic because that was a kind of weird uh, murky soup of configuration that you had to do about seven, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. But as of now, you're good. You should be just fine. I wouldn't sweat it. You can absolutely go in and find your specific system and forward specific ports, but your router's gonna do that. You're, you, if you are running a router from 2005 right now, uh, you should change out your <laughs> router rather than <laughs> try and fix port forwarding that way. Yeah, right, right. And we're gonna talk in the second segment a little bit more about the router side of things and how far they've come for gamers. Uh, before we get there though, one, one final thing that we can talk about here real quick, DNS, domain name uh, system, uh, service, sorry. Uh, what, what about tweaking the DNS settings? Is that gonna give you uh, any significant gains? No. Okay. Do not do this. All right, moving on then. No, sorry. <laughs> well, no, no, it's, it's a totally valid thing to look at because yeah. you will see power users talk about yes. put in a custom DNS setting. This may be very useful if you're trying to access a certain nation's uh, content while you're in a different nation. Uh, but if you are in the United States and you are wanting to play video games or you're wanting to use Netflix efficiently or whatever it is, don't bother. It's going to okay. be fine. You're more likely to mess your connection up than notice anything that's noticeable. Hmm. All right. Well, then we have the definitive answer there. That was uh, that was directed to the point. So we are going to talk about routers uh, coming up here in a second, but I do want to take a break and thank the sponsor of this episode of Know How, and that is Avnet. Thank you for uh, joining us this week, Avnet. How does groundbreaking technology uh, incubator debut its latest idea for solving life's absurdities by leveraging an end-to-end -end ecosystem uh, that turns ideas into marketable products. Not Impossible Labs is doing something really cool. They had an idea for technology that could revolutionize live music. Uh, the team wanted to bring the experience of a concert to a group who had traditionally found it completely inaccessible, the deaf community. Obviously, they would go to these concerts, they're missing out on a whole layer of, of the experience. Uh, live music is something the hearing able take for granted uh, and it's such an incredible experience uh, that touches on all of the senses. So a challenge lies in making concerts and live music events more inclusive for the deaf. With Avnet as their guide, their idea evolved to one of the most sophisticated wearables on the market, helping uh, to bring a shared live concert experience to everyone that was there, called Music Not Impossible. It's actually a product that allows deaf and hearing concert goers alike to literally feel live music, and that's through advanced vibration technology and they're all experiencing it together for the first time on the same level playing field. Those wearables are truly wearables in the strictest sense. They're wearing a vest and components that send vibrations through the ankles, wrists, and chest. The hearing able to receive music vibrations through, their, through the ears while attendees who are deaf and wearing these wearables receive those vibrations through other parts of their body and that allowed many of them to respond to the live music alongside everyone else to actually dance to the music, feel it. Uh, literally feel it throughout their body. For many, this was a first for them. It's an innovation that literally opens up a whole new world of music exploration uh, to those who might not hear it in the traditional sense. Avnet and Not Impossible Labs revealed Music Not Impossible at the Life is Beautiful Music Festival in Las Vegas. A few months back, it was a big hit. And this is exactly the kind of innovation uh, that was brought to the finish line because of Avnet. So check it out for yourself and see what this, the, you know, one, what this wearable is all about, and two, how Avnet made it possible. Visit avnet.com slash music1. If you go there, you can see the journey. That's avnet.com slash music1. Uh, just some really cool stuff. Talk about innovation. Just amazing technology. And we thank Avnet for their support 
of know-how. All right, so we thought uh, with the second segment, we'd kind of dive a little bit into the router side of things. We've talked to kind of at a, a more broad sense of some of the challenges that gamers face when they want to take their gaming online and network them and multiplayer environments and all this kind of stuff. Um, thankfully now, especially nowadays, routers are being built with the user's you know, kind of intentions in mind. So there's a whole series of, whole uh, you know, set of options for gaming routers that are specific to gamers. And thought we'd kind of dive into that a little bit. What, I mean, how long have we been seeing, is, is this a relatively new thing? What, what are they bringing specifically? What does a gaming router actually provide to a gamer that's gonna make them happy with what they get? See, Jason, I'm so glad you have me on for this because I'm happy to clarify that for the most part, you're not really getting anything all that different. Because again, <laughs> UP, UPnP has yeah. really solved those issues I mentioned earlier where port demanding games created these sort of complications. Right. That would be sort of the thing I would imagine a gaming router might specifically solve. Uh, a gaming router is going to have the things that you want in a generally good router, which is to say, gonna have really strong radios, perhaps support for mesh networking, although that's definitely not a thing, mesh networking meaning that you have multiple repeaters in a home, uh, making it easier to get on wireless uh, access from wherever you are in your house. Um, it, it, more RAM, essentially, and uh, customability, meaning uh, you, you can expect uh, all of the different bells and whistles uh, within a configuration menu for all of the sort of things you might want to do. Uh, any good router is going to essentially have all of this. A lot of memory, really good radios, solid mesh networking support, and honestly, it's the configuration that's really gonna matter. Meaning, if you have a home, if you have a lot of people playing video games at your home, if you need to sequester certain traffic, if you need to keep a child off of the internet at certain hours of the day, these are the kind of things that you're going to wanna get out of a good router. Some gaming routers will have this stuff in mind, so that if you have a kid who loves Fortnite and you wanna make it very clear when they can and cannot log online to play Fortnite, you can pick per device or per access point uh, password wise to decide when they can and cannot play with certain kind of traffic. So that really, I think, is going to be the biggest thing that you get out of a gaming router as opposed gaming advertised router as opposed to a standard good one, which is configuration options that lean into those parental kind of controls. Should gamers who have a souped up gaming router or just really a modern router of any any sort? Um, what should they choose? Being being plugged in, being in a wired connection into the router or wireless? Obviously, you could do either, and I'm I'm guessing that wireless is there. There's some drawbacks to that, right? Convenience always comes with some drawbacks. Uh, Absolutely. What would you say? Yeah, you're going to you're going to face a little bit of packet loss when you're playing wirelessly. That is just how that's going to roll. And wireless protocols handle these redundancies very efficiently. So if you just want to play some casual, solid online gaming from any room in your house, you're going to be fine uh, it, wireless. But if you want to guarantee the best possible performance, you're going to want to be wired, no matter whether you're playing on PC or on console. Uh, in fact, we're filming uh, in November 1st, this episode, Nintendo just announced a whole bunch of stuff about this game Smash Brothers the Ultimate. And one thing they pointed out was that they're encouraging Switch players to buy an additional add-on that adds Ethernet cable support to the Nintendo Switch. Uh, I think that says a lot that Nintendo is shouting that out as mm -hmm. if to say, Smash Brothers is one of these very competitive, very intense, hardcore fighting games, and they want online players of that game to be prepared and to wire up. Although with the Nintendo Switch, I should point out, there are a lot of reports out there that its optional Ethernet adapter heats the system up to an unsafe degree, or at Whoa. least that people find unsafe. Uh, like like it will burn you, or it will fry the internals of the... I think it's that it's just a lot hotter to the touch than you might okay. expect. And, right. I, and when it comes to a system that's portable like the Switch, you kind of want to err on the side of not burning hot whenever humanly possible. <laughs> yeah. So wired is going to be what you want, but it's not necessarily convenient wherever you are uh, in your home. So pick and choose, find the right room in your house to set that router up. Maybe, you know, bundle cables up along the tops of 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 ceilings and door frames and things. There's really nice. not a ton we can say to make 
uh, wired performance more elegant, then you're going to need some cables. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or some holes in the wall. Um, if wireless, this could be like a, a programming problem. If wireless, then five gigahertz or two point four gigahertz, or du uh, versus dual band, or what do you think of, as far as that's concerned? I mean, any modem, any router you're going to get. Pardon me for mixing up those terms. Uh, is going to support at this point all the way up to AC and beyond uh, in terms of that highest level, big throughput kind of connection. That being said, it's going to probably have two different access points you can log into. Some routers just try to automatically say, uh, you connect and we'll decide whether it's 5 gigahertz or 2.4. I would suggest turning that feature off with any router you use because you're going to get different performance in different points of your house. So 2.4 is going to reach a lot further in an average home. 5 is a little tighter. You can be, uh, a for, it, whatever stuff is in your house can block a 5 gigahertz signal in the way that 2.4 is not blocked. So poles in your wall, aluminum contents between the floor and the ceiling, things like that can really stymie 5 gigahertz performance. Mm -hmm. uh, and you basically want to pick which of those two signals make sense for the room you're going to be using your device in. Uh, if you're walking around your house, for example, just do 2.4 so you're not constantly switching and losing those little moments. Because if you're taking that thing from one place to the other and the router auto magically changes that up, you're going to lose five seconds, give or take, of gameplay. So find the right room. Uh, and there's certain uh, machines that actually come with a uh, network analysis. They will read out every single signal. I want to say Killer, Nick. I can't remember the exact name of it. I've done terrible research here. But Killer is the name of this company that makes software that will essentially read out every single access point, even ones you don't have passwords for, and create sort of a chart that shows exactly where on the network spectrum the 2.4 gigahertz signals are and the 5 gigahertz signals are. And from there, you can go in your router and you can say, you know what? I want my 2.4 in this frequency. I want my 5 gigahertz in that frequency because my neighbors are competing with that. That's absolutely something that will benefit your performance, whether you're just streaming Netflix or trying to play a good wireless game. So keep an eye out for those sort of analysis tools if you can. They're generally free and they're awesome. Yeah, awesome. Um, okay, well, kind of speaking of, of routers, I thought we'd bring this on here. This is the Netgear Nighthawk Pro Gaming Router, the XR500. And you'll have to, to pardon, this was this was the previous home of a sticker, and so apparently that's about as clean as I could ever get that. Um, Padre actually did a review of this on the new screensaver uh, not too many months back, and he was a big fan of this router. Uh, I saw a lot of reviews kind of pointing to this router as one of the best gaming routers that you can buy. $293.99 is the price that I'm finding on this uh, right now, so not inexpensive. Part of me wants to say, you know, based on what you were saying in the previous segment where you were like, well, I don't know what you actually get out of a gaming router versus just a nice souped up router. You get something that looks like a spaceship is probably the upgrade, similar to the the uh, gaming PC that we looked at uh, a, a few mo weeks ago, uh, where, where a lot of it just seemed very visual. But uh, anyways, it has four Ethernet ports uh, with LED uh, lights on the front to kind of indicate you know, how active those are. Also two USB 3.0 ports for direct data transfer on the side. Uh, it has a gaming dashboard. You were talking about it, it, kind of the dashboard. And from what I understand, the NetDuma gaming dashboard on this is actually really great. It gives you all that kind of control that you're talking about, uh, including things like quality of service for setting the priority of devices as you go along. So if, it, if you want to make sure that your gaming PC is getting the most, you know, the most priority in the entire stack of devices connecting to it you can do that also geo filtering uh, is offered through here and apparently this the the net duma dashboard is just really easy to use so that's that's kind of probably part of what you were talking about right like when you get a gaming router it does all these things that are specific which all routers can probably do most of those things if you if you play around with it long enough these are just going to make it a little bit easier to get to and easier to understand uh, from a gaming perspective Absolutely. I, and I think that uh, something about a, an automatic quality of service tool set is 
really nice if you have a lot of people juggling or, or fighting for access mm -hmm. on the fly. You know, maybe you just want to make everybody else in your family suffer for with slightly crappier Hulu and Netflix signals because you've got a lot of Fortnite to play. And that's it's nice to have a device that will just do that. So, you know, you're, I think the price that we're looking at is closer to $300 yeah. uh, as of while we're talking about this. Uh, and the pick that I threw into our list is on the other side of the spectrum. It's a $110 uh, router as of uh, press time. It's from a company called Microtik, the word micro plus T-I-K. Uh, and they've got a few out there, but look for the one that's close to $100, $110. Uh, if you are willing to go into your router's settings and pick through everything. This one starts out with a pretty basic default uh, menu system so that you can set sort of the basic things you would want from a router. And if you want to do things like quality of service adjustment or any other sort of optimization, you're going to have to go through some higher level power user menus. Uh, so you're not paying as much and you're going to have to finagle around, look at the instructions, maybe consult forums to get those exact kind of tweaks that a gamer router may serve to you on a platter. But the the Microtik one that we picked is uh, really loved by readers at Ars Technica's forums because its radio performance is through the roof and its customization just to get it working is really easy. Meaning you can hand this to grandma. I mean, you might want to help grandma with the first step, but you can essentially do that five minute setup of setting the, the username and password and things like that and get it running. And then if grandma decides she really wants to take some night classes about uh, network optimization, she can go to town. Yeah, um, although it doesn't look like a spaceship, so I'm going to ding at a point for that. You can listen. I've got a really nice set of cardboard pieces and scissors okay, and markers. Right. And if you want to add some really sweet flames and wings to that Microtik router, I will happily help you. Everybody, right, just right. come on over to 123 Awesome Lane, my yeah, house. That's cra that's a crafty approach. I like the way you think. Uh, excellent stuff. So that And th those two, between those two, that's that's like quite the, the delta of price, right? like 110 versus 300 dollars so um also a lot of people as far as the micro tick are concerned uh, is concerned are probably going to like the kind of smaller profile right like this thing one of the complaints that i saw about the xr 500 is while it's a you know while it's a beast and it does many things and it has it has many bells and whistles like mounting it on the wall is just not uh something that you can do this is meant for a desktop it's going to take up more space and uh, you know maybe maybe it's designed that way because it looks really intimidating. It looks really impressive, and in certain people's you know uh, gaming gaming rooms, this is gonna this is gonna fit in with a decor. Let's say so. Maybe there's something to that, but I don't think it would fit in with all of my stuffed animals over there. To be yeah. quite honest, <laughs> all right, they I would, get it. They would probably all revolt against it. You're you're a micro tick house. I understand. I, I get it now. I, I, I see you, Sam. Uh, let's take a break, and then we're going to talk a little bit about kind of cloud gaming on PC and Mac. We've talked a little bit about this in, in terms of consoles. We're going to flip this and in, in go into uh, the, the PC uh, realm and kind of see what the options are there. We'll dive into that for a, in a second, but uh, first let's take a break and thank the sponsor of this episode, Know How. And this episode is brought to you by Ring. I got to tell you, so, so uh, we're recording this on November 1st. Last night was Halloween. And Halloween is like my favorite ring holiday because I set my doorbell up. I, I, I took one of my, um, one of my bells uh, outside so that when people rang the doorbell, they heard a, a witch cackling. Like, and then if, if someone stops by, when we were out trick-or-treating, we left the bowl of candy out on the, on the front step right in front of the camera. So inevitably, some kid is going to walk up there and be like, well, no one's here, so I'm just going to dump it all in my bag. Yeah, I know who you are, kid. I know who you are. I got it on video. Actually, it didn't happen last night. It did happen a couple of years ago. So thankfully, that kid learned their lesson. But anyways, Ring is awesome for Halloween. It's awesome for so much more, actually. You've heard of Ring before. We've talked about it all the time. They're the ones who did reinvent the doorbell and let you answer the door with your phone, no matter where you happen to be. Well, they just reinvented the home alarm system, too. We all know traditional alarm companies prioritize high monthly premiums and then tie you into long-term contracts. So Ring changed that. Ring Alarm is an easy-to-install, affordable home security system with no long-term contracts. You can build the system that's just right for your home and have it up and running in minutes. The Ring Alarm Security Kit comes with everything that you need to protect your home. 
have a box right here. I can show it off. Uh, everything that you need to protect your home, there we go, uh, is inside there. You've got the base station uh, that, that kind of syncs up everything that's going on with your ring system in your house, it keeps the alarm system online and connected to mobile devices. You've got the keypad, of course. You can put that anywhere. Uh, it doesn't require a connection to a, a power outlet or anything, so you don't need to do any drilling or anything like that. It arms and disarms the whole alarm system. Uh, the contact sensor, which you can put uh, any you know on a door or a window to make sure that you know when it opens or when it closes. Uh, motion detector, so you can detect motion from inside your home and have that kind of tie into the whole system. And then a range extender that's going to, uh, well, extend the range of the system throughout your home and to all the other uh, ring components that you have. I love this system. Ring is also doing some work around changing their UI on their on their app. They put out a, a new change that I switched over to a week ago and I love it. It like captures a snapshot of each of your cameras and presents that snapshot, you know, whenever motion is detected as like the last known snapshot from that camera. It's, it's just better than seeing a picture of a, of a camera. Instead, you actually see the, the video of the camera is like a snapshot, and then you can go in there and see the live view. It's really, really useful. Uh, it really is a smarter way to protect your entire home. The Ring Alarm Security Kit is available when you go to ring.com. And also, you can find their products in retail stores across the U.S. very easily. Everybody's getting Ring nowadays. Go to ring.com slash know-how, and you can learn how to get whole home security for only $10 per month. $10 per month will allow you to kind of feed in all of those, those camera inputs and, and keep those in the cloud for when you need to, hopefully you never need to refer to them, but if you do, they're there. That's ring.com slash know-how. You're going to love your Ring system, so check it out. Ring.com slash know-how, and we thank Ring for their support of know-how. Uh, and for helping me with my my Halloween plans because it's always fun every year. All right, so let's uh, let's focus a little bit on cloud gaming specifically. You know how these services are are now opening the playing field. We're so used to, or at least I'm so used to thinking of gaming capability as being directly tied to the components inside of my PC. Let's say, and I don't have a, an up to date modern. Uh, gaming rig, so I'm out of luck, but it turns out so much, you know, the, the fast speeds of the internet nowadays uh, that are provided uh, through our ISPs enable so much more, all this gaming to happen in the cloud, and it's almost like your, your PC becomes a, a dumb, you know, a dumb terminal that it's all piped into. Um, do you use these services, and, do, and like, what machine are you using them on? I can use them on a few machines. My Windows PC uh, can handle PlayStation Now. Uh, my Windows PC can also play with GeForce Now, which is NVIDIA's offering. Mm -hmm. uh, and as of very recently, any computer I have with a web browser with Chrome can play with Google's Project Stream. So that's quite a bit. And that's on top of my PlayStation 4, which also runs PlayStation Now, unsurprisingly. Right. Right. So in general, you've got computer access to cloud services, this is beginning to happen. Now we've been we've seen this sort of thing for some time. On Live ran uh, its own tests and services quite a while ago, and that company eventually cratered. And I believe its uh, portfolio of patents was scooped up by Sony. Correct me, I can't remember exactly, but definitely someone came in and scooped up the work that they had done up to this point, where you are. Uh, essentially having a send and receive party with a giant server farm elsewhere that serves you games typically at very high settings that run on your own computer no matter how weak it is. Yeah, Sony did actually end up with those patents, 140 gaming uh, cloud gaming patents uh, as of, uh, well, this was four years ago. So OnLive, OnLive was definitely ahead of the curve. It was, a, it was ahead of the game as far as this is concerned, uh, no pun intended. Now we're seeing this a whole lot more and it's a lot more capable. Um, are there ways that you optimize around this specifically? Again, does it does it just kind of tie back into what we've already been talking about, um, or are the rules a little different when you're talking about streaming a game from the cloud to your computer? Honestly, uh, and we're going to talk about this in a bit, but your optimization is going to be uh, 
paying most, paying for as high speed of internet as you can because Got this it. is very demanding. Uh, what you're getting is essentially a video stream that needs to run as efficiently as possible. Uh, so it's not so much, uh, it's not going to be uh, twitchier if you have better internet. Like if you go up to gigabit, you're not going to get a faster uh, button press to action kind of time frame necessarily, mm -hmm. but you are going to get a sharper picture because that data throughput, you're going to want for less compressed, more clear images because there's a server farm uh, creating your video game, putting all that 3D Im imagery together and sending you frame after frame after frame as quickly as possible. And just like on YouTube, the better your connection is, the less blocky and grainy and artifacty the resulting image is. So there's not a lot you can do there. Uh, obviously, things like buffer bloat and some of this latency mind and stuff will affect how quickly your button presses react. Because when you're playing on a cloud service, you are tapping and then that tap has to go to the server Right. The server identifies it, and then it pops out the image resultingly and gets that back to you. So you're having this extra amount of time uh, from the button press to seeing what happens. And that's on top of any latency that you might get from, say, your HDTV. Uh, so if you have this all plugged into a TV as opposed to computer monitor, you might lose another, you know, 50 milliseconds. Oh. And that doesn't seem like a lot a little bit by a little bit, but it can add up, meaning Street Fighter isn't necessarily a good game to play on any of these streaming surfaces. However, something a little slower paced, like running around in a Tomb Raider game, could be a little more forgivable, where it's not about instant twitchiness, but more about that cinematic action experience. Yeah, so from, from what you're saying, it, it does sound like there can be some choices made, like, you know, the TV, that's a prime example. There are, there are components of this that just by its definition, what's happening, you know, from sending that command to the server and interpreting that into the, re the received frame and bringing that back, that latency is almost fixed and, and, you know, maybe improved by the speed of your internet. But if you, like you said, that's a really great tip. If you've got that going into a TV, that's going to add more latency, maybe focus on buying a, a, you know, a monitor with, with a very low, uh, with the low interpretation for that and you're going to see some improvements there. But that, that really spells out kind of one, one of the other overarching points on this is that there are certain types of games that are just fine, and there are games that are just not going to work. I would guess that fighting games just in general probably aren't that great to do in, cloud, uh, in a cloud sort of way. If you're playing at home with a friend and you each have a joystick and you're just fighting each other, you'll be fine. It's not perfect, but right. you'll, like, especially, I think um, some of these 3D games, uh, Tekken and Soul Calibur are my candidates. I'm not saying those are up on any cloud services in particular, but they're examples of games that are a little bit more forgiving in terms of the kind of combos and button presses you're doing, uh, as opposed to something like Guilty Gear or Street Fighter, which are these really hardcore fighting games. Uh, but you definitely don't want to play those online against other people, because then you're adding the additional latency yeah. of having somebody oh. else out there to fight against. So that's not the way to go. Same with a puzzle game. Tetris, for example, that sounds like a nightmare on anything other than the super easiest difficulty to make sure that exact button press of something like Tetris, a game that you would think of like Tetris was essentially a bad candidate for a streaming service. But I point to something like Tomb Raider as something that would work. Uh, yeah. Assassin's Creed is, one, is another example of something that would work. Big worlds... And not necessarily that like, oh my God, I get to press the button right now. It's a single player game. All of the AI and computer enemies can sort of flux accordingly with that kind of experience. And that's a lot of games. I could even, you could even take a game like Madden and uh, which has some twitchiness, but is also forgivable. And I think that would work too. Yeah, and so, you know some of these games also have kind of modes that that can smooth things out. You know, it might not be perfect for the enthusiasts of that particular game, and sometimes they have player assist modes uh, that yeah. could and help. In, in general, that in general, if it's a single player game, you're in better shape than if you're trying to play a multiplayer game. Yeah, Most single sense. player games will either feel a little bit floaty or totally normal. So I, if you if you're willing to, especially if you're just a casual gamer who just wants to pop in every once in a while, that's where these services really work because you're likely n not playing those games to be the twitchy master. You're right. jumping in. If you wanted to be the twitchy master, you would buy the $2,000 computer and the $300 router and all of that stuff. By logging into a streaming service, you have a, an affordable option to play games that look modern. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, very, very convenient. So let's talk a little bit about those. Well, and actually, you mentioned Assassin's Creed. 
This one kind of came out of nowhere. We, we had heard rumors that Google was working on some sort of game console. It turned out when they finally announced it, and I don't, I don't believe that it's totally out for everyone yet, or maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but Google Project Stream is their approach. And like you said, this is all happening in a Chrome browser, right? You played with in this. In any, any Chrome browser that is on a computer, meaning it's not currently working on smartphones or Android tablets. But if you can boot Chrome, you can start playing Assassin's Creed uh, Odyssey, which is the newest Assassin's Creed game. This is a invite-only beta, and they let a lot of people in to the earliest wave of the beta, uh, but not every single person. And part of the requirement was that you had to do sort of a network test that you reached at least a 25 megabit per second late, uh, download rate in order to be able to play. Hmm. Um, so that's a little demanding. That's not just anybody's internet speed by default, but it's also kind of doable throughout uh, in a big city sort of internet way. Uh, and it just works. You, it'll identify whether or not you have a controller connected to the computer in question. Uh, and the Xbox One, Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and PlayStation 4 controllers all have USB options, meaning with Chrome is on and Chrome senses that you have plugged in one of these controllers via USB, it will go, hey, I found a controller, done. And I was absolutely shocked at how smooth that controller connecting was. Wow. That being said, if you just want to do PC and or a mouse and keyboard on the laptop that you're using or desktop that you're using, that will also work. And there's a whole control config for that. And from there, Assassin's Creed is a great example of a game that really benefits from a high-powered server in terms of that server is pumping out a ton of 3D data, a giant world with huge draw distances, big open seas, all that sort of stuff. But also, you don't need that exact button crazy, perfect timing kind of slapping of buttons. You may have a crowd of bad guys come up, but you get a pretty forgivable window if they're about to attack you to dodge or roll or get out of the way or block. Uh, you'll even get a little bit of Matrix-style slowdown in those situations. Mm. So it really does lean nicely into that little bit of latency that you get. And I will say, I definitely noticed a little bit of latency. I'm very sensitive about that sort of thing. But I could totally play the game. It was built exactly with that limitation in mind. It felt totally fine. And it's free until the beginning of January. It's just a free vert test of Assassin's Creed Odyssey that they're giving away if you can get into the test. So, you know, go. you can head over and sign up. I don't know at, at what point they're going to just let people in by the, by the droves, but yeah. I was able to get in pretty quickly and other friends of mine were as well. So it's a pretty decent sign. And we're filming in November and the test is still going to be live until January. From there, we don't know what Google's going to do. Right? Mm -hmm. Clearly, they've built something that works really nicely in Chrome. So I really doubt they're just going to chuck it in the trash. But it's going to depend on who they sign up, what kind of partners, what kind of games, and on and on. So we don't know that. But we do know one game works darned well on it. Right on. Okay, cool. I can't wait to play around with that myself. I am not invited. I'm not as cool as you, Sam. Well, uh, you just got to know the right people. <laughs> All right. Well, that's true. Maybe I do. Uh, GeForce Now. This is cloud-based GPU. We actually had an email from James who said, I use this for gaming on my laptop that's using the embedded Intel graphics that's part of the second gen i5. Really great for the really casual gamer once a month if that much, and doesn't want to invest in new hardware. And that's, I, I think, one of the biggest benefits of doing this sort of cloud gaming is that, like you were just saying, not everybody is of the caliber where they want to spend $2,000 on a, you know, on an advanced gaming rig. Uh, they just want to use the thing they have and just hop in now because they had the impulse to do so. Uh, is this a good option for that? Absolutely. Uh, at this point, every major streaming service is kind of to the same point. Now, GeForce is a little confusing because there's multiple options here. Uh, one of them is connecting to their cloud system uh, and streaming games from their server farm. Another option is that you're actually streaming things from a powerful computer in your house to other less powerful hardware in other rooms in the house. This is also pretty effective, but you definitely add latency to it because you're not a full server farm, you're just one computer with your local internet. So that actually tends to not be as fast as connecting straight to their server farm and going from there. Uh, but both work in a pinch, but that's a completely different use case. The problem with GeForce Now is that it really is unclear what games work for it and how much it costs. Now, I'm not currently a subscriber to GeForce, uh, 
But it's just uh, just trying to find that exact information. And if you guys have that info for the exact cost per month and what games you get, you should definitely serve that up to uh, our viewers because it's kind of unclear. NVIDIA doesn't make it easy to just go here, buy into it, download this app, and boom, you are streaming games from our servers. So I think that's my biggest beef is that NVIDIA has never been really good at getting this information out in really clear ways to users. I know what I'm doing, and I'm looking right now trying to figure out yeah. where the heck to just buy into it. Yeah, I know. I'm looking too. I, I saw something from a last year, an announcement of $25 for 20 hours of, of gaming that was announced at CES. This was last year, though, so it could have even changed beyond. Yeah, that. it looks like it's currently a beta situation at this point, which Got probably it. means uh, that they're not ready to charge people uh, and that the, therefore the selection will be limited and their performance could be limited. Uh, but people who are in it, uh, I'm sure are stoked, especially if that beta is free. So... You know, definitely keep an eye out for that. You can you can go. I uh, actually had to click around Nvidia site for a bit. That's a terrible <laughs> URL. I can't even. I can, I wish I could just say Nvidia.com slash give me the thing. Yes. that would be great. But they do have GeForce Now waitlist. If you can search for that on your favorite search engine, then you'll be good to go. Yeah, DuckDuckGo is a, is a good, great one to go for. Uh, PlayStation Now also, we and, you know we don't have to spend a whole lot of time on PlayStation Now, but we because we already kind of talked about this a little bit uh, in a previous episode. But uh, this capable through your PC, right? Yes. What's the the bad news is PlayStation Now used to work on more devices, including the PlayStation Three and a bunch of smart TVs. And a while back, Sony said we're scrapping that. You can't play this on your Samsung smart TV anymore or your PlayStation 3 or older stuff. So they narrowed it down to just PlayStation 4 systems and Windows 10 PCs. So that's still a ton of devices in terms of Windows 10. It was really actually a good system through the uh, through smart TVs. But I think that they changed it up because they wanted to essentially create a broader platform of newer PlayStation 4 games to eventually stream. Uh, that wasn't the case at the time. It's still not the case right now. But if you can load it on a Windows 10 PC, you can hook up your own USB controllers. They don't have to be PlayStation branded controllers. Uh, you'll lose some of the functionality depending on the game when you do it that way. But... You can play a ton of games uh, for a either monthly or three-month subscription fee. Um, it's a giant load of games, and it comes with the same caveats that we mentioned for the other streaming services, meaning those twitchier games are going to be a little bit rougher, but those single-player experiences, and especially Sony has a bunch of them, just a bunch of God of War games and uh, Uncharted games. These work when it comes to sitting on the couch by yourself with that little bit of latency, you'll still be fine. You'll still be able to win, even get the platinum trophy if you want to be one of those achievement hunting types. So that's definitely, I think it's right now, it's the easiest thing to recommend because it's the clearest one where they will take your money and serve you games on the cloud. Yeah, they don't make it difficult to find out how much to pay when you go to their website. <clears throat> not not yeah. like somebody else I know. Yeah. Uh, I think, oops, you did it again. You informed our audience. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> what a weird oops. I don't even know what to do with that oops. That's okay. That's why I did it. I, I like I like making you uncomfortable, Sam. Uh, Sam Scovich, it's always fun doing this show with you, even when we have to talk about something uh, as potentially not fun as networking, but you've made it oh, fun, so thank you. Man, networking is just a party, and everyone's <laughs> invited to the networking party. Yes, just, to, the just connect. to the land party, yeah. Uh, oh, wow, that's such a dated reference. Uh, next week... We have an episode, of course. We're going to be talking a little bit. I mean, I guess it kind of touches somewhat on the topic that we were doing today, but it's more of a focus on streaming and broadcasting your gameplay live to the world. Maybe you want to be the next uh, game, you know, Let's Play Master uh, on Twitch or whatever. You're such an old man. You can't even name one popular Twitch streamer. Name okay, one. Okay, go, go. I, no, you're right, I can't. <laughs> Well, maybe by next episode, you will right. be versed in all of those streamers, and maybe. then you and I will help our audience become the next great ninja. Look, I can help people become good bot good pod and broadcasters. Uh, you're going to have to bring the game knowledge to this one, though. 
Happy to do it. All right, right on. So we're going to do that next week. We're going to dive into that. Uh, links, show notes, past episodes, subscribe links, everything that you need to know can be found when you go to twit.tv slash KH. That's where you're going to find all the episodes of this show, be it our current module on gaming, be it the previous module with Megan Maroney and Florence Ion on uh, IoT. Everybody in chat saying old man howl now. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, and, and beyond. The Padre, of course, has a number of episodes, <laughs> most of the episodes. And those are on really kind of how to uh, you know, makery uh, topics. Uh, we cover the gamut on know how, and you can find it all at twit.tv slash kh. New episodes will appear every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Sometimes we're doing these recordings live, sometimes we've pre recorded some of them. So just rest assured, if you go to live stream twit.tv slash live, you're going to find it played at 11 a.m. next Thursday and Thursdays beyond. Uh, we are on Google Plus still even though Google Plus is going away for now, we have a really great community there. If you want to search for the community, you can do that. You can chat with people on all sorts of know-how topics uh, with nearly 12,000 other fans of the show on all of those things. So just uh, go, go search for it. Go to Google Plus and search for Twit Know How and you'll find it. As for you, Sam, where do you want people to follow all the awesome work you're doing online? I can be found on the Twitters at Sam Red and Ars Technica ArsTechnica.com, I can say it, is the home of many of my writings, uh, myself and my colleagues, about games, virtual reality, social media, science, health, uh, Teslas, all kinds of stuff. You, you cover it all. You're smart. Uh, <laughs> you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Jason Now. I'm also all over the Twit Network doing lots of shows. Uh, a little bit later today, doing Tech News Weekly. Make sure and tune in for that. And then, of course, we have the technical director today, whose name, I believe, is... Master Blaster? He's something like that. I okay. prefer Alex, but... Oh, okay. It's nice to have you back, Alex. Well, thank you very much. This is the first uh, time I've done it in a couple months, I think. <laughs> you haven't had someone giving you a, a different name every single week for quite a while now. Uh, How's it feel? Uh, I miss that a little bit. <laughs> okay. I'll remember to do that in the hall. Yeah. If you don't mind. Okay, that's that's fine. So for today, your master that. blaster. Okay. I'll, I'll come up with something more creative. Right, thank you very much. All right, good. It's good to have you, Alex. And, and, and you can find me on Twitter at the Mac and Josh. There we go. All right, good. I'm I'm happy you're being honest today. Uh, that is it for this week. We will uh, be back next week with another episode and know how. And now that you know how, go into the cloud and and do it or something. Bye, you guys.